So, as the holiday season rolls along, what is the thought that's on everybody's mind? Presents. Yes, presents. And here on the channel, we would like to give you the tools to give a gift to those game aficionados in your life. These are the top 10 games that we think would make great gifts for your friends. So I'll start us off with our number 10. Uh, my number 10 is a heavily thematic game, and um, it's a game that has a lot of fun potential for you, like going one-on-one -on -one with an opponent, and um, that's Santorini. Um, it's got a decent theme to it. I like the artwork um, on the cards and um, how they build up that board that you're playing on with all the little pieces. The components are really cool. And you can get into some pretty interesting matches where you're kind of, you and your opponent are like one move away from winning and you kind of have to make sure that you don't make that one mistake that ends up making your opponent win. And I think that's really cool. I like Santorini too. It's a little abstract, but once you actually build up the board with all those little... The Greek style buildings. Yeah. Um, it really does look like Santorini, those classic blue domes, whatnot. The only downside I find for the game is the base of the board getting that, like, the nub with oh, yeah. the little, like, I'm kind of like, what do you do? It, it, that's it doesn't always fit the best, but once it's together and you're building it up, it looks really cool, I think. It does look cool. So, what's your number 10? That would be Potato Pirates. Oh, that's a fun game. <laughs> I know. Surprising. In this game, as it suggests, you are a pirate, and so are your friends. But you also happen to be potatoes. And basically, by using basic programming concepts, you mash, fry, and uh, roast your opponents to sink all of their ships. And then you want to be basically the only one left standing, or sailing, I guess. <laughs> um, and I like this game for a lot of reasons. It's really family friendly it's educational it's a lot of fun it's easy to learn and it's original i don't really know a game where it's like hey let me have my kids and my family and my friends have fun with me while also learning stuff yeah. usually it's just you know flash card remember those flash cards got when you were a kid um you're not often uh potato pirates with your family either so that's unique yes um, I do. I do also like the um, the very like the spud uh, oriented plays on words that they have for the ships and stuff. That's that's a lot of fun. They're very punny. Yeah. <laughs> um, the art's cute. I also like the pom pom potatoes. They're a lot of fun to throw at people. Yeah. Uh, and I don't really have anything else to say. It's a good all around game. It has a lower price point, which is good for you know little add on gift there. Yeah. And it's a good length. It's not a very long game. I think we were done in 20-ish minutes, maybe yeah. half an hour. It's one of those games where you could get together with your family and play like three or four rounds of it and not feel like you're, you've are you been playing for a marathon uh, gaming session. Okay, so let's move on to our number nine. So number nine on my list is a game called Mountains of Madness, which is a game set in 1931. You and your friends play explorers, scientific explorers, who go out on expedition and discover this strange, exciting new mountain in the Antarctic region. And while exploring this mountain, you guys discover some sort of mystery which tests your mental fortitude and you all start to go insane. And the game becomes a test as to whether or not you guys can survive your own insanity, you know, and actually leave the mountain. I like this game for a few reasons. First, I feel like it has very strong components and a very strong theme in the Lovecraftian style. It's based on a novel of the same name. I also think a lot of the madness conditions are pretty funny. I mean, some of them are legitimately irritating, but most of them I just find amusing. My personal favorite would be dashing, for sure. I like my little my mustache. <laughs> you forgot your mustache. I can't talk to you. Oh, wait. I already screwed up. <laughs> Can't you take talk. more madness conditions? I can talk to you. I have the mustache behind the camera. <laughs> So we all did we all enjoy that game, right? We did enjoy that game. Okay. Um, I wasn't a big fan of having to sit on the floor, but and that one's less of really a um, something that prevents you from like figuring out the puzzle. It's more of just an annoyance to <laughs> make you sit on the floor. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of, of them that are really funny, and you can kind of see people's interpretations of the different madness cards based on if they can find loopholes. Like you found a couple of loopholes in some That's of the madness cards. Difficult. <laughs> 
Um, and, but, I mean, you have some legitimate ones that can make it really difficult, like the one where you answer in the affirmative whether the answer is yes or no. Um, that one can really kind of mess you up. There is annoying ones, like having to tap on the table constantly. It's Morse code! Yeah. I'm going insane! That, that, that's your way of beating that one, just tapping Morse code to communicate. <laughs> the only problem with that is your entire table has to know Morse code. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah. And I feel like this game is also a really good length. It's not too short, not too long. It's like 45-ish minutes. Yeah. It was an amazing experience, the fact that when we played the first time, we played with three people, and it finished at exactly the time that it said it was going to finish on the box. It went to an hour on the dot, which is really rare for, uh, I feel like, board game lengths listed on the box. Usually it's like within 15, 20 minutes of what they suggest, especially if it's at an, about an hour. Um, that hour mark it usually takes you about an hour 15 or so, especially a first playthrough. And we finished out an hour on the dot, which is a good length for that game. Um, I like the little um, airplane. That, that's a cool little component. And the hourglass. Your pew pew action figure? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good choice. Um, Thank you. My number nine is Magic Maze. And that's a game that we've had fun with with uh, different groups in the past. And you can play with a decent amount of people. And it's... All the fun out of that game comes with the people that you're playing with because you can have some people with some really funny reactions when they get frustrated and how they get kind of spastic with the um, the signal pawn. Um, the whole basis behind the game is you're a bunch of fantasy creatures trying to run around a mall and then escape after getting the items that you need to get. Um, and it, there's some... Um, uh, mall tiles that all connect to each other and you kind of have to move with move your pieces based on what cards you have in the beginning of the game so you can either you might be able to move only down um or you might be able to go through portals um or you might be able to only move to the right so you kind of have to move the pawns around based on where they need to get to and what you're able to do as a player so it's kind of non-verbal communication and I like the components, I like the artwork, it's fun. It's a mall mixed with fantasy creatures, which is cool. Um, and it's bright and colorful. Fantasy characters, technically, you're like a barbarian and like a wizard, I think. Isn't one of them like an elf? Yeah, something like that. Creatures, characters, yeah, like fantasy, it's a fantasy theme in a mall. <laughs> with alarm systems. Yes. Um, and there's, uh, there's different scenarios that you can play out, um, which is cool. So there's a lot of replayability to it. Um, it's also one of those games where I feel like you're going to have to play through each scenario a couple of times to get it right. Well, you level up. Yeah. Which is fun. Brings back all those Mario times. <laughs> Mario times. Yes, it's a, it's a platformer made into a game. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so those are our number nines, and we'll be back with number eight. So, for my number eight, I have one of my favorite cooperative games, and that's Pandemic. Um, this is one of the first games that I ever added to my major collection once I started really collecting tabletop games, and it's a it, it's a fun game. Um, you have a couple of different characters that you can play, which each have the unique abilities. There's obviously a couple of combinations that work better together to complete the game. Uh, like you definitely want to get the was it the medic and the transporter uh, or dispatcher? I think it was Tra dispatcher. The one that does the helicopter that can move people around. <laughs> um, and it, you're moving around the the world trying to figure out cures for the diseases that are breaking out around the world. And you want to av avoid those epidemic cards that can really start like a, a cascade of bad stuff that can really end your game. Uh, if you're playing on the harder levels where you have a lot of epidemic cards, you can lose the game pretty quick. Like you could be chugging along, doing really well, and then all of a sudden in two turns you've lost. Um, but I think it's less like an eldritch horror where you feel like you had to slog through the whole game and then you lose at the end um this one it's a quick enough game that you can you can be you can just shuffle back up and play again and you're not too frustrated by the end if you lose um what are your thoughts on pandemic um i would agree i think that some of the roles don't benefit as much as others um i think there's one in particular where I'm totally blanking on the name right now. You get to make the um, extra bases 
Oh yeah, yeah. the the construction one. Like he's got the guy in the construction hat. Yeah. He I get him a lot, and he's he's not very helpful. The best character overall is Medic Jesus, <laughs> who just walks into spots, tells diseases to go away, and just. <laughs> Stands, stands there for a turn. Yeah, once you, once you have a once you have a medic and you've developed the cure for the disease, you just walk through the city and it's just gone. You don't even have to use an action to cleanse it, which is you're literally just purging the land of disease. You're parting the disease sea. Yeah, um, yeah well, that's could, Moses. Yeah, well, that's very true. Uh, um, different allegory. Um, the the construction's guy, the construction guy. I feel like the only thing that makes him useful is the fact that you can travel from research station to research station. So you almost use it as a fast travel, but that's not its intended purpose. It's kind of like um, finding a use for the least useful character. Um, but I think it's a great game. I like the theme behind it. Um, I've been meaning to dive into Pandemic Legacy. Um, I don't have it, haven't opened it up yet, but I definitely think that's going to be one that I'm going to have a lot of fun with. Um, so what's your number eight? My eighth game is Clax, which is based on Terry Pratchett's Going Postal. Long explanation, which I'm going to read to you. Using a semaphore system of shuttered lamps on top of high towers, the Grand Trunk Semaphore Company has revolutionized long-distance communications on the disc world. Their network of towers covers most of the unnamed continent, but now the old postal service is fighting back, driven by the determination of newly volunteered postmaster Moist von Lipwig. The Ankh-Morpork post office has challenged the Clax operators to a race from Ankh-Morpork to Genua. Genua? <laughs> May I just state... That man's name was Moist von Lipwig. Yep. Moist Lips. Mr. Moist Lips. It's very, it's very, um, very Terry Pratchett, <laughs> the theme behind it. So, when you play the game, someone has to be Lip von Moistwick or whatever. Moist von Lipwig. <laughs> yeah, to be Moist Lips. No, you are actually the antagonists from the book. Yes, I have actually read this book. Oh, Not yeah. his best work, but yeah, you work for the semaphore company and you're trying to prove that you're better and you could pass the message. You get usually a word of like five or six letters and you have to type it out. And if it's competitive, oh God, the competitive <laughs> version of this game is it's frightening. Oh, so you're, you're fighting Moist Lips. Fun with Lipwig. No, yeah. Moist Lips. <laughs> Yeah, the um, you're basically the eternal march of progress, trying to stuff out the jobs of the postal service. <laughs> Lippenbacher fighting Lippenbacher. Uh, I feel like in this kind of in this game, it's got an interesting mechanic that I don't think I've seen in anything else. That's yeah, very unique. Um, and uh, the if you are a Terry Pratchett fan, it's Which I am. yeah, it's almost kind of like a much must buy because like, there's not a lot of Terry Pratchett themed games. There's there's enough to make it like a handful. Um, right. There's obviously not as many as there are like Lovecraft games or something like that. But I think that's a little more of an expanded mythos. But the all of the Terry Pratchett games are very steeped in their theme, and you really get a good appreciation of them if you know the the theme behind them and like have either watched the movies or read the books. Um, I, I read the books are obviously the preferred method, but the movies are good. <laughs> Cheater. <laughs> um, that's a good choice. Thank you. So that's why I made it. <laughs> that's why we made any of these choices. <laughs> Come on, chair. We'll be back with our number seven. So number seven on my list is a game called Dragon Farkle. In this game, you and your friends are basically wannabe heroes who have the super awesome task of slaying the dragon that's terrorizing the land. Because people don't like when dragons eat their livestock and kill their children and raid their homes and burn, burn and ate the land. Can we say that? Is that trademarked? I don't know. Probably, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry! They won't know. <laughs> <laughs> um... I like this game because there are a lot of unique characters with abilities. I mean, the artwork's like a weird pencilish kind of style, yeah. but it's not something I, I appreciate. Like, it's well done, but not my thing. Um, it's really easy to learn. It's simple. And, you know, it's a little bit based on luck, which can be a little irritating if you're not a good dice roller like our friend Will Wheaton. <laughs> <laughs> But I like it anyway because I get the glory of slaying a dragon, and yeah. who doesn't want to slay a dragon? 
Um, it's probably the best push your luck mechanic out there. Um, I think it's kind of boiled down very well in that game. Um, the I mean, you have a little bit of that in like um, King of Tokyo a little bit, but that's not really... You can't bust at the end. You just can kind of like risk what you're getting. Um, I, I, I just love the fact that you can go in with like tens of thousands of people and just lose. And just like have the dragon literally eat like several villages all at once while you try and fight them. Uh, I'm just going to get an army of like 30,000 people and um, the dragon just ate all of them. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's a really fun game. The entire Holy Roman Empire's army all killed by one dragon. One dragon. Right. It's all, I mean, it all comes down to luck at the end with the die. Like, you're, you're rolling those die throughout the whole thing trying to avoid the one symbol and then at the end, that's the symbol you're trying to get. Um, so, my number seven is a very unique game, I feel, because the mechanic is something that isn't really present in anything else, and that's Once Upon a Time. Uh, Once Upon a Time is a collective um, storytelling game where you have cards, and you're trying to play those cards to out of your hand as the story progresses to kind of move the flow of the story towards the secret ending that you have. And... It's really cool because you can make a, a great narrative with your friends at the table. And if you have some creative friends that have a lot of personality, you can have a really funny, fun story. Um, and But there's enough of a mechanical element that it keeps you still the fact that you're playing a game. Um, you're not just telling a story, and you you do try and some sometimes you have the, the you have the people that play, and they're like that's a very loose association, but you know I'm gonna play this card anyway. Um, but it can be really fun, and then if you play it with the same groups over and over again, you kind of end up developing some characters that like return to later stories, and maybe some elements that is kind of like it's almost like world building. It, it's it's a good. I like the um I like the artwork. Um, it's like a, a drawn kind of like pastel kind of colors. Um, it's a nice it's a nice game in terms of aesthetically. And I also like that there are a lot of like little box expansions you can get with more specific fairy tale themes. I think there's like a woodland creatures or mm -hmm. something of that nature, and I want to say there's at least five of them. So if you ever get tired of the first you know box, which has a I think three decks of cards for the story, and then the um, or it could be two. And then the the ending cards, you know, that's another few decks. Yeah. And, I mean, based on the, the, the different endings that you're trying to get to, you're obviously going to start the story out differently because you're, you're, you're kind of starting it in a place where you think you could logically get to your ending. So since there's enough endings, there's a decent amount of replayability with just the stuff out of the box. But having those options for the expansions are really good. Um, I like any... any company or a publisher that is going to support their games with expansion content I, i'm always going to be for that because there's some out there where i think that it has a decent amount of replayability and then they kind of forget about the game and then there's no expansions down the road even though you kind of expect it but this one's supported which is good um so we'll be back with our number six so starting off with our number sixes i have another fun cooperative game and that's castle panic castle panic is great in most aspects it's great in the way that you have a really fleshed out cooperative gameplay um i like the artwork um i like the me that the mechanics are very simple to explain like you can open it up and explain it to somebody in less than 10 minutes um even including some of the extra stuff that comes from the expansions and you're basically playing um, as somebody who is ruling a castle and you're trying to stop all of the, the fantasy monsters from getting to your castle walls and knocking them down and you have to play knights and archers and I like the fact that the, it's like a, a creeping progress, like a creeping dread kind of game and you have to really balance out your hand and trade with the other players and keep lines of communication open where you can set it up properly and get each monster as it moves to each ring whether it's the archer ring or the knight ring or the swordsman ring um and i think the everything that's included in the expansions uh just adds to the experience of the game 
Um, I don't think there's anything that seems tacked on or anything. It seems like a logical extension of where it would go. Once you start adding in the wizard tower and spells, that's a lot of fun. And you're always protecting your wizard tower. I will lose the entire rest of my castle trying to protect that wizard tower. <laughs> The wizard tower is god. Yes, the wizard tower is... Once you lose your wizard tower and you're playing against the expansion monsters, you're pretty much done. <laughs> yeah, but you always wreck my tower. Yeah. With the boulders. I don't know what it is with you. Yeah, I have really bad luck when it comes to uh, where the boulders go. Boulders can really wreck your game. As well as your house. Yeah. And catapult. They had, what is it, trebuchets that they added later on? It, yeah, was like the, it was like the flying boulders version. <laughs> Everything just wants to crush you. Yeah. So what's yours? Number six for me is a game called Evolution, where oh, you're basically trying to design the animal most capable of surviving. Uh, I like it because I feel like you can make the argument that it's like marginally educational. <laughs> it's, it's teaching you about adaptable traits and how they help your little animals survive. Your unnamed animals, I'll just call them like Panda 1, Panda 2, because they like pandas, <laughs> even though they totally don't look like pandas, but it's fun. Uh, <laughs> They're also not very evolutionarily sound. Don't, don't ruin this thing. <laughs> just shush. shush I, like, okay. I like the pandas. Just let me have the pandas. <laughs> anyway, and the art is really nice. Like the little tokens with the plantsies on them, and then you have the... Um, the cards with the traits on them and just the art overall is very yeah. nice. Yeah, the box art is really nice. Like the with the, e the iguana that they have in the box is really nice. I think is it's like an one? iguana. It I, I think like that's iguana. one of the expansions has the iguana, uh, maybe? maybe. There are a lot of expansions. A lot of pretty boxes. That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> what else? It's also one of those games that there's a, a lot of different ways to play. Like, there's, um, you can kind of do the strategy where you can have, like, multiple creatures. Like, you can expand out to m for more yeah. creatures. You can kind of focus heavily more on one. There's a lot of, um, different ways you can play it, and I appreciate that in any game. Um, so, we'll be back with our number five. Number five for me is a game called Shadows Over Camelot. And basically, you and whoever you're playing with are knights of the round table. And you're trying to complete quests and bring glory to Camelot before the evil forces of evil ruin your day. <laughs> Destroy your castle. They be evil. Kill your king. You know, whatever. Uh, I like this game because it has a lot of strong thematic elements. Everything ties together. The components are pretty well made. Um, and overall, it's a good co-op. But there's also the chance of a filthy traitor. Yeah. It's always this guy. Always <laughs> him, without fail. Even when we don't have a traitor, he's the traitor. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's one of those games that can be really frustrating also if you have the traitor and you play through this whole big long game and the traitor's just been biding their time. Like the last time we played, and we were like way towards the end of the game, and then all of a sudden I just did one move. I added that last catapult. Yeah. Which just when like, you just lose the game. Well, in the game's defense... Or the kingdom's defense. The game is hopelessly skewed in favor of the bad guys. It's not like Eldritch Horror Impossible, but it's not an easy game if you actually no. play the way you're supposed to play the game. And if you have a traitor that's, that's at all decent at not outing themselves early, they pretty much are guaranteed to win towards the end because they're going to get to a point where all they have to do is make one move. What's the qualifier for? It's just, they're, they're pretty much guaranteed to win, period. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's be honest here. Don't get the people's hopes up. Um, yeah, you so you're lucky if you get that traitor, uh, if you become the traitor of that game. Um, but I, th I like the thematic elements, um, and it has a good um, amount of dread to it. Like, you kind of always feel like you're right on the edge of losing most of the time. It's like, oh no, I gotta go fight the Saxons, but if I go fight the Saxons, then the Picts might beat me, and then I gotta save this card for the, was it, the Black Knight? And I gotta, you know, fight the dragon, and it's like, there's always, there's all these things that you can do, and you kind of, you kind of get wrapped up in holding on to cards to do certain quests, and then that you end up having to use them for other quests. Um, I think it's, I think it's well designed, and it's designed to be hard. 
Um, and especially having the traitor in there makes it even significantly harder. Um, I'd say it's um, a more punishing traitor mechanic than, say, like a Dead of Winter. Mm. Um, Dead of Winter, you can, because you have the ability to vote out somebody who you think is the traitor, you might guess wrong and vote out somebody who's not the traitor. But because you have that ability and it's a little bit harder for the traitor to hide themselves, I feel, for as long as Camelot, um, at least to put themselves into a position where they can win it like immediately um this one's a little bit more punishing but i like it um so my number five is carsico and i absolutely love this game to the point where i have like i think three expansions for it i have the abbot i have the rivers and i have the dra the princess and the dragon expansion mm, i think traders and builders but i think the rivers one comes, comes with... with it came with the version that i got yeah um which is a good yeah. Which is a good um, starting point because you can just kind of build out the river and then you already have like places to start. Um, I do like starting with the river expansion. Uh, I believe most of the ones that are on the market now, the game's been out for a while, and most of the ones that are on the market now start with the river expansion. Um, but it's a great game. There's a lot of variability on how you play. There's a lot of strategy. You're basically um, a, I guess, a member of the ancient town of Carsicone, was it the 16, 1700s or something that it's referencing, um, and you're building cities, roads, and you're trying to get points by placing your meeples, making them um, knights inside of the city, or farmers by laying them down on the fields, or highwaymen, and um, based on where you place your meeples and where you place your tiles and how the whole thing shakes out, you see who has the most points at the end. There's a lot of varied strategy. Um, some people use farmers, some people don't use farmers. I think that's the, the biggest one between different players. Um, and once you add the dragon in, if you have the dragon expansion, that, that can be a lot of fun. You can send the dragon to eat your opponents, which is always amusing. Dragons are always <laughs> amusing. Yeah, dragons just add to everything. Dragons are perfect. We need dragons in every one of these games. No matter what the setting is, we need a dragon. Future dragons, past dragons, modern day dragons. <laughs> any it could be any culture's dragons. I don't yeah, care. Yeah. It could be Chinese dragons. I don't care. Yeah. Chinese dragons are very pretty in the yeah. artwork. <laughs> Hong Kong has buildings that allow dragons to get through. Allegedly. <laughs> well, now after that long diatribe about dragons, we're we'll be back with our number four. So my number four is a game that I think might have more different themed versions of it than maybe any other game, and that's Munchkin. Munchkin in all of its different forms, whether it's Zombie Munchkin, OG Munchkin, um, Post-Apocalyptic Munchkin, Marvel Munchkin, all the different versions of it. Um, oh, Cthulhu Munchkin. Uh, the, all the different versions of it have the same basic mechanics, like you're, you're kicking open a door, you're trying to fight a monster out of the door. You're making your little adventurer and trying to get him to level 10 to win the game. And it's about, like, you know, screwing over your friends. <laughs> like, making those monsters stronger so they can't beat them and get to level 10. Or um, trying to, like, play the, was it, like, the trap cards on them? Or the, the, the crisis cards or whatever they call trap them. Trap cards. The, yeah, trap cards. Right? You got it right the first time. Yeah, yeah. I second-guessed myself. I promise your friends will hate you very much after the first game of Munchkin because you will do probably whatever is possible to screw them over. Yeah, you will... Um, it, 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 could, it could break up friendships, at least for, for a little while. And then you get back together and play more games. It's like, can I beat this this level 5 monster? No! Plus 10! Plus 15! Plus everything and the kitchen sink! <laughs> It's a, it's also probably the only game that I've ever seen where it's like it's best to be the third person trying to win. That's the best position to be in because everybody like shoots out everything bad that they have, or at least like seventy five percent of everything bad that they have on the first person trying to win, and then the second person gets the remaining twenty five percent of everybody's bad stuff, and the third person's like, "Hey, I'm just gonna win because you guys ran out of stuff." Um, that's the best position to be in. So try and position your your person as third. Um, but it's a fun game, like, especially the different themes, um, the zombie themes are amusing, because you can, like, have, like, a leg as a weapon and things like that. What are your experiences with, uh, Munchkin? Well, I, uh, have the pleasure of screwing over my friends a lot, <laughs> but then they're mean and don't let me win games, so that's a little heartbreaking. <laughs> I, I do like the different themes, I mean, I, I personally just have the OG Munchkin, because classic stuff is good. But 
it's good for everybody. You always get a little bit of what you want. And you're going to be obnoxious. Yeah. It's an excuse to be obnoxious. <laughs> which is nice until it hurts your feelings. <laughs> anyway. My number four is a game called King of Tokyo. Which basically is a game where you and whoever you're playing with are monsters. Trying to take over Tokyo. You want to be the biggest, baddest monster ever and show everybody who's boss. You know, kill them all kind of thing. Um, there are two different versions of the game. I have the original. Jeremy has the newer version, which swaps, I think, two of the monsters out. I think yeah. the version has, like, a cat and a penguin, and mine has not the cat and the penguin. <laughs> I don't even remember. They both have, uh, like, non-copyright infringing Godzilla and non-copyright infringing King Kong in them, though. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Gigasaur, Gigasaur has some problems <laughs> with copyrights and trademarks. You get like a mechanical dragon, and is it like the Swedish thing? Maybe. Yeah, uh, there's like of... the there's like the the alien one. There's a penguin in a spacesuit. Yeah. yeah, but that's on his version, not my version. Well, no. I can't. I, I can't remember the difference. I know the penguin is the big difference, and I, the, I like penguin the penguin and the cat. I think. For yeah. Sure. But I, I think I have, like, a squid monster that you don't have. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, copyright Cthulhu. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, I like this game because it's fast. It's easy to learn. It's definitely family-friendly. Um, I mean, there's King of Tokyo, which I think is, like, the slightly more adult version of this game. I mean, King of New York is a slightly more adult version of King of Tokyo. But... You, either one, they're not too complex. There's no. something like a kid could definitely learn and enjoy. Um, and I have a lot of fun with it. I like beating people up as a mechanical dragon. <laughs> I'm always mecha dragon, so. Or as an emotional lizard who doesn't want to be sued by the Japanese people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, the artwork is fun. I like the fact that you get to roll big die. That, that's cool. Um, and it does have like a little bit of a pressure lock, but you just like, like I was saying earlier on, um, the dragon farkle you can't bust in this game you could just end up with something not that you wanted with crap yeah um and the it's a fun game the artworks is great i like the cards the power cards can definitely add something to the game um you can have a very straightforward game where people aren't buying a lot of the power cards but then you can really skew the game if everybody's using a lot of the power cards um and you got people like rolling extra die and you have people that can just kill you when you roll certain things like there's some of the some of the the power cards are pretty op um but it, it's a it's a great game and um like you were saying it's easy to explain to people it's a great gateway game even if he loses gigazor will still be depressed and have daddy issues <laughs> <laughs> poor gigazor needs uh, some therapy no one loves gigazor <laughs> he used to eat lunch with the mecha dragon <laughs> <laughs> now he's in the outcast table. We're, we're making a fanfic currently. Uh, maybe uh, we'll upload it one day. <laughs> <laughs> Gigazor fanfic. <laughs> My, it's like the the Harry Potter <laughs> fan fiction, but we're Gigazor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll be back with our number three. Number three for me is a game I'm sure everyone's heard of. It's Settlers of Catan. And in this game, you and your friends are trying to build the strongest empire by using your resources wisely. You're obviously settlers, as the name suggests. Uh, I like this game because it involves a lot of strategy. I mean, I never win, but I'll get there. I'll beat you one day. And, I mean, it's a classic. Like, this is a cornerstone of board games. Yeah. It's kind of that game that everybody's heard of. And a lot of times it's the game that people use to introduce people to more complex games, I feel. Um, I was a little ways into my, like, my tabletop gaming, uh, career, experience, <laughs> life, before I played Catan, but I actually really like it. Lakota's beaten me. <laughs> yeah. We rarely beat you at any of these games, I hope you know. That's okay. That's why we team up against you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, have I ever won? Yeah, you won one time on Catan. And I lied, I won one time. The last time we oh, played. Yeah, last time we played, you won. Yeah. And we played a 15 million times, and I have not won any of those times because I just fool around in German accent. <laughs> Talking about my rock hard wood and my, my sheep. My wood. The, the game, I feel like the game has to go with, you have to play it with the willingness to trade. Mm. Uh, there's some people that play the game and they don't trade, and the game just kind of drags on. 
because nobody wants to trade anything to anybody. You kind of have to go for mutually beneficial trades, and I feel like the game balances itself well enough that there's enough different strategies and different ways to get points that you can trade around and not be kind of constantly in com competition with each other. You might be going towards building another city. Um, he might be going towards building roads. Um, you might be trying to get um, the development cards. There's a lot of different things that you can use different resources for, and they balance it well with what um, are the requirements for the different um, things that you're trying to build are. And I think that that works out really well from that aspect. The, the components are nice. The, I mean, the artwork is, it's pretty basic artwork, but it's, it's nice. Um, and something I really like about it is the fact there's a lot of expansions. Yep. I even got you one. Yeah. You should open it. Yeah. Why <laughs> yeah. haven't it, you opened it? Is it the Barbarian expansion? I have, I have the Barbarian. Oh, Knights and Barbarians? Is that what the... Knights and Cities. Knights and Cities. Barbarian. You don't even know what I got you! <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, We're not getting you any games this Christmas. Uh, well, I have to add to my collection. It's more content. Well, add to your collection, but you actually have to open it. That's very true. Can, I will... not, can we not have this family dispute on the video? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good drama. They like drama. Um, yeah, I mean, it has a lot of exper expansions. Seafarers is a really popular one um, because it kind of changes how the game is played. I think the most out of any of them. Um, though the Barbarians for Knights and Cities is, uh, or Cities and Knights, what is it? Cities and Knights, right? Knights and Cities? I had it right the first time. Um, the, the Barbarian kind of adds a ticking clock element to it, which is kind of cool. It can, like, wreck your stuff. Um, but, again... I like my stuff. <laughs> Don't wreck my stuff. As I always say, I like a game that's supported with extra content. And the, it do, this doesn't seem like a game that's going anywhere. And it's definitely a game that they're going to be supporting into the future. So I would definitely kind of try and pick that up. Um, my number three is another Lovecraftian-themed game. Um, it's a very popular theme, as we've discussed in the past. And that's Eldritch Horror. Um, this is a cooperative game where you're traveling around the world trying to solve mysteries, gather clues, and fight the Lovecraftian horrors coming through portals, trying to defeat um, or solve the final mystery with your um, the, whatever old one you're going up against. It could be ancient one, I think. ancient ancient one, ancient great one. old one. Um, it could be Elder Cthulhu. Elder. It could be the uh, Azal Azaloth or Azathoth. Yeah, the thoth. Uh, <laughs> just, just throw just throw a bunch of vowels and consonants together, and you'll probably come up with one of their names. If if you spit enough at the person you're talking to, that's a Cthulhu, that's a name of a monster. Yeah. Um, it's it's a great game. It's very hard. Um, it can be punishing at times. Because she said. <laughs> it can it it can be very <laughs> punishing <laughs> at times. <laughs> Um, it can run into an issue sometimes where you're, you have a very smooth game going and it, you get to the point where you're towards the end game and all of a sudden you go from, oh, we're sitting pretty, we're a couple of, like a clue away from winning to, oh, we lost. Yeah. And it can happen really fast because there's a lot of ways that the, the bad stuff can kind of build on itself. Like, you can just have the wrong mytho mythos cards come up. You can have the wrong monsters come out of portals. You can have just the wrong... It just happens to be on the wrong tracker that hit, triggers the wrong thing. And it uh, some of them don't give you a shot. There's, uh, I think, <laughs> one one of the ancient ones, or great old ones, when you beat it, uh, or when you uh, trigger it waking up, it, you just lose the game. Um, that's It's the one they recommend you start with, which is weird, isn't it? I guess the that's the recommended starting ancient one is the one where you flip it over and you awaken it and you lose. Um, a lot of the other ones, if you awaken it up, uh, wake it, wake it up, like Cthulhu, um, you get a final yeah. mystery, yeah, and you still get a, a shot to win even if you've woken up the ancient one. But it's a punishing game, but it's really heavily steeped in theme. The mechanics are fun once you get it down. The combat, everybody, it's one of those games where you forget how to do the combat every time you play and you have to look it up but um it's a fun game and there there's a lot enough theme and enough characterization that you can have a good time with it what are your thoughts well just to update you guys still haven't won <laughs> still a little upset about it might be a while before i pick it up but it, it's a good game it's a little skeevy it's it's horror friendly friendly yeah. horror horror friendly friendly horror i don't know uh, no question. <laughs> I'm not, mm. 
and the artwork is strong artwork got some good flavor text but need i need another train ticket you know <laughs> <laughs> or some more mental stability that would help yeah. especially if you're not a cultist <laughs> Yeah, all, all of the Lovecraft themes kind of uh, center around like madness, and that was kind of his claim to fame. And it's it's in this game too. Um, <laughs> sanity is your your one of your big currencies that you're playing around with. Um, all right, well, we're getting into the we're getting into the nitty gritty here. We'll be back with our number two. So we're getting into the big ones. Number two, uh, my number one and two share a, a theme, and let's see if you can see what it is. Once uh, I announce them, uh, my number two is Tyrants of the Underdark, um, and that is a great area control and deck building game, which is an interesting combination. There's not really other ones out there like that, I don't believe. Um, at least I can't think of one off the top of my head. Where normally deck building games, you're trying to buy off of like a marketplace, whether it's like Star Realms or um, Hero Realms or Dominion or something like that, where you're buying cards, adding them to your deck and getting points or some kind of power or something like that. And this game takes that and adds it to the ability to place um, soldiers out on the field and control different parts of the Underdark. And you're trying, you get points from area control, you get points from your cards that are in your deck, you get cards from, uh, points from the cards that you've promoted. Um, and it, it, it's a, it's a fun game. Like it, it it has a lot of elements that I like. I like deck building games. I like area control games and slamming them together kind of makes a great combination. It's like, Hey, I like jelly. I like peanut butter. You put them together in one sandwich. It's going to be a good sandwich or a good Uncrustable. Not sponsored, but I will be sponsored by Uncrustables. I prefer the Nutella ones. The Nutella ones are really good too. Um, but um, it's a great, it, it's a great thematic game. Um, it's based off the forgotten realms, um, the drow, and you know, or dark elves, as some people know them. As. Thank you. Um, if you're thinking of like a Skyrim mythos, it would be like the dark elves. Um, they live underground, and they're all about like their family name and their honor, and trying to uh, very like Game of Thrones style get themselves to the top. And that's kind of simulated by the fact that you have your inner circle and you're promoting cards and getting points through that through your machinations, and. Um, it's great. Like the the expansions that they have for it are like extra cards that you can add. Um, I have one of the expansions, um, but it really just kind of adds in the different ways to play because there are certain decks that have to deal with the insane outcast where you can give negative points to your your opponents, and then there's ones that are straight about like placing spies and all that kind of stuff. And I just think it's a really great game, a great combination of mechanics. It's really unique. What are your thoughts? I, I don't have much really to add to that <laughs> at all. You take all the things. <laughs> Stop it. 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 I, I just like to be thorough. Whatever. Well, what's your number two? That would be Champions of Midgard. Oh, that's a good game. Where, essentially, everyone who's playing is the leader of some sort of Viking clan. Uh, and you've traveled to a harbor town that is being attacked by things like trolls and jogger. And basically, you're trying to defend this area use your resources wisely and go off on quests to beat even scarier monsters to get, you know, the glory of the gods on your side and their favor. Um, well, glory and then the favor of the gods. I said that kind of weird. Anyway. Favor and glory. That. In some order. That thing you said. <laughs> and basically, when the game ends, the player who has the most glory earns the title of Jarl. They're the Jarl the Jarl. <laughs> um, and they're recognized as the champion of Midgard. So, I like this game because it's like Lords of Waterdeep, but with Vikings and fighting, which is awesome. Um, and it's a good length. It's, I want to say, roughly 45 minutes or so, at least every time I've played. And there are lots of expansions. By lots, I mean, I think, just two at this point. <laughs> <laughs> good lots expansions! Oodles and boodles of two expansions. <laughs> hey, two expansions is a lot for uh, in the board game world. There's a lot of games that have no expansions. Do I get so. to become the Jarl, Jarl, and Carl of any kingdom I want in that case? Yes. yes. Like, do I get to be the Jarl of Whiterun and sit on my throne and just do this for now? <sighs> no one can see what I'm doing. Demonstrate it. 
But um, they had the one with the mountains where you could, you could go up into the mountains. Wasn't that one of the expansions? And I think then there's, there's one, one that archers. added archers. Yeah. I don't know if we pulled the other one out yet. No, but um, yeah, it's a it's a great game. Like um, I really like Lords of Waterdeep, and it's very similar to that. Um, it's a more I feel like it a- adds elements to Lords of Waterdeep. Right. Um, but you're not really completing quests in this one. So yeah. Much. I mean, you have, like, overall goals, which I think they call destiny or fate cards, or there's, like, a... F- oh, yeah, when you can get the little cards. Yeah, but I wouldn't really call that a quest. You can play the game without even doing those. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's really helpful at the end if you actually no. get a bunch of those and complete them, but um, it's not, like, a core mechanic of the game that you need to complete. The... I think it's kind of interesting that again, there's it's one of those games where there's different ways to play. You could you can sail, you can spend your whole time trying to sail and go fight the strong monsters, but then that leads uh, the other player to staying at home and fighting the trolls, and you could end up getting um, was it the the disfavor tokens like the, yeah. the dishonor tokens, um, which end up being negative points at the end. So there's kind of there's there's risk reward in the different things that you can do. Um, I like the 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 die rolling aspect of it which is cool um i mean you could just be really unlucky though and you could go in with a a strong force to go up against one of those monsters and just roll really poorly um but then managing your favors where you can re-roll die right um it's a great game it's got a great theme um and i really like it i would definitely recommend it to anybody so this is the big one number one we'll be back So at the top of my list is a game called Agricola, where you and whoever is playing are farmers, and you're trying to basically make the best farm ever. You get points based off of, you know, having more sheep, or a certain amount of sheep and pigs and whatever in your farm. Uh, I like it because it's, you know, there's a lot of strategy involved. You really have to think, am I going to go all sheep? Am I going to go all cows? Am I going to keep a cow in my house? No, no, no. Um, and I also love the animal meeples. I am all for those animal meeples. Yeah, they're really well done. I like them. Hashtag animeeps. <laughs> and there you go. Animeeps. Spread that around. <laughs> Spread that around, boys, everywhere. Animeeps. Um, yeah, the, like, the components are really cool in that game. It's, the big thing with Agricola is if you go in and aren't thinking ahead from almost the very beginning, you're going to mess yourself up. You kind of have to plan out exactly what you're going to do right. relatively early on in the game, or you could box yourself in um, with how you're placing your fences and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also like Caverna, which is a very similar game, except you're you're in a cave and you're dwarves. So it's like farming plus mining plus yeah. dwarves. Is so, that your number one? It's not my number one. Oh, okay. It's honorable mentions. <laughs> honorable. Yeah, Caverna would definitely be an honorable mention. Um, the but Agricola is a great game. Like uh, it's also a um, an, a relatively easy game to teach to people, and there's a lot of replayability based on how the cards come out. Um, yeah. You can kind of they might come out in a different order, which can mess with how you normally would play. If you you're waiting to get a specific tile flipped over and it doesn't come out until the very end, then you know, might mess you up. Um, so my number one was actually referenced a lot during um, our Champions of Midgard discussion, and that's Lords of Waterdeep. That is probably my favorite game. I know. Yeah, we've played it a lot. You make me play it a lot. Yeah. Um, Not that I mind. <laughs> usually win. Usually, but like that's why you love it so much. <laughs> I love it so much because, like my last game, and here's the theme. Um, I'll connect it to you. They're both Forgotten Realms games, and they're both D&D. Um, yeah, D and D, Forgotten Realms, oh, and thing. Wizards of the Coast. And the in this one, the thing that makes it unique, I feel, is most things involving Forgotten Realms or D and D, you are playing the adventurer. You are the the fighter. You're the rogue. You're the wizard or the cleric. Um, you are the one that's being sent out to kill monsters and gather trolls' heads and all these things to get experience and bring them back to your quest givers. In this game, you're playing one of the lords. You're basically playing a quest giver, and you're trying to complete different tasks, and you have to go send your agents to different locations around the board to gather 
like fighters from this area or rogues from this area or wizards and i think that's cool like you actually get to be a quest giver for a little while which is something you probably wouldn't get to do until you're like really high end campaign level in um in D D. but i think they balance it really well and it probably has my favorite expansion to any game also in scoundrels of skullport which adds a whole new mechanic to the game that I feel like once you've played with the new mechanic, you basically can't go back. Like the, the new mechanic kind of changes the game enough in a positive way that the base game almost becomes like it, it's inferior at that point. <laughs> um, but it, it's a great game. There's a lot of theme to it. Um, the components are great with the little wood pieces and like the little, um, the first player, um, the castle that's for your first player. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on uh, Lords of Waterdeep? I too like Lords of Waterdeep. I feel like the components <laughs> yes. are very strong. Everything's pretty well made. Doesn't but the money specifically doesn't fit in the box very well. There's always yeah. some that pops up. Um, I do like the expansion a lot as well. I think it adds a lot of depth to the game. Obviously, corruption is key because hey, I got all these resources and you didn't because you're not corrupt. But then. I lose points, which yeah. is no bueno, because I want to beat you. I'm going to beat you. It's going to happen. <laughs> um, happen. I also do like the fact that they kind of, um, they added a lord that thrives off the corruption mechanic, which is interesting. Yeah, but it only really benefits you for a little bit, because it's like, I think you get four points. Yeah, you get four points per corruption, so if the corruption track goes beyond negative four, then you're in the negative. Yeah. But how much of a lead did you get? being able to go all the way up to that negative four and that's based how the how the game breaks out the other one the other expansion is under mountain and that one has the 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 big whopping like 40 point quests um that one adds some like really big quests to the game the before the 40 point quests your biggest quests were 25s and i remember in the base game when you got one of those 25 point quests you're like oh i'm gonna take such a big lead now somebody bangs out one of those 40 point quests and you're like going across the entire board uh, the track there um and the the different expansions had lords that keyed off of those specific components like you have the one that um gives you points based on building buildings from the expansion as well as completing quests from the expansion and um in in both of them they have the same kind of um mechanic and i just think they they add really well to the game so yeah that's our list we got through our number ones um we're gonna have links down below for the games that we've talked about in our countdown we'll ha also have a, a list in the description of all the games um in case you need like a quick reference guide um and uh it doesn't uh cost you anything else but it really helps out the channel and we really appreciate it Hey everyone, thanks for watching the video. We have a lot of reviews up on the channel talking about some of the games that we discussed in our top 10. And feel free to check out our review of Mountains of Madness, Lords of Waterdeep, and our discussion about Eldritch Horror. If you like what you see on the channel, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, leave a comment down below talking about your top 10 gift games that you need to give away this holiday season <laughs> and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you're notified of everything i post in the future i'll catch you in the next episode real smooth <laughs>